Hello, this is Music Tech Help Guy, and welcome to episode 60 of my Logic Pro 10 video tutorial series. Uh, this video is the second video of my mixing uh, mini series. So we're still working on this that same song from uh, episode 59, Living on the Run. Uh, and in the previous episode, we just went through and did a basic balance mix. We went through and um, played with the, the volume faders, uh, played with the pan. Uh, grouped the drums and just sort of got a an overall decent uh, you know uh, balance uh, among all of our instruments. Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, equalization using an EQ, the parts of an EQ, and we're going to EQ our drums here. Um, when I'm mixing, I always like to start with the drums. For me, in rock and roll and even in dance music and and even in other genres as well, I mean, uh, the drums are really sort of the foundation of the beat, the foundation of the groove of the song. So. Um, some people would say, well, why not start with the the vocals and mix everything under the vocals? I don't know. My my uh, the way I've always done it is start with the drums and mix everything to the drums. So that's just the way I've I've always done it. So this is what our drums sound like right now. And they sound pretty decent. Um, there's some noticeable things about the kick and snare that I want to fix, uh, as well as, as a lot of the cymbals. So uh, let me go ahead and hit Shift uh, G to take these out of the group or to suspend our group. Actually, I need to unsolo them, then take them out of the group. Um, let's start with the kick tracks. Uh, in the previous video, I, I completely just muted the iFET track because I didn't really like the way that, that mic was sounding. Uh, but I still have this uh, D6 kick track, which is the D6 is inside the drum, and then a Yamaha sub kick on the outside. So let's listen to what just the D6 sounds like. And it's not bad. I want it to have a little bit more slap to it. Uh, as far as the punch is concerned, we're going to have to sort of, we're going to have to get that from a compressor uh, or, or some other dynamic uh, plug in. And this brings up a, a good topic is I typically EQ before I compress. It's just my general rule, EQ before compression. Um, and my, my idea for that is that basically if you compress a, a track and then you EQ it after the compression, you can kind of undo some of the dynamic processing that you're doing to it. So uh, I always like to put uh, EQ first and then compression second. And by the way, EQ and compression are sort of like your bread and butter of mixing. Um, before you even start thinking about using, um, you know, modulation and time-based plugins like reverb and delay and chorus, before you start using any of those sort of special effects plugins, you want to sort of make sure that the mix sounds good with just EQ and compression alone, or, or EQ and dynamics plugins. So in this video, we're going to use two different uh, plugins. We're going to use one that's called the Channel EQ and the Linear Phase EQ. Um, they're both almost identical in the way they look, but just the, how they affect the sound is slightly different. And one other thing I want to mention real quick is in this video series, I'm going to try to, for the most part, stay away from using third-party plugins, which I do use a lot of third-party stuff. It's just that um, I, since this is a Logic series, I, I'm going to try to stick with Logic's plugins. And believe it or not, Logic's stock set of plugins are, are pretty decent. Um, so I'm going to use the channel EQ for now. So I'm going to throw the channel EQ right there on the audio effects insert. Whoops. And again, if you miss that, it's uh, right there on the audio effects insert. To open up uh, your effect, you just click on it. And it'll open up the, uh, the, the window for it. Now, if you're using um, Logic 10.0.5 and earlier, I believe, the channel EQ is going to look a little bit different. It's going to look basically the same way it looked in Logic 9. In Logic 10, they get, gave the interface sort of like a, a revamping. So it looks prettier. Uh, it doesn't necessarily function any better. Um, it doesn't sound any better. It just looks a little bit different. So before we uh, EQ our, our kick drum, let's talk about some of the different... Um, let's talk about what an EQ does. An EQ basically can boost or attenuate, boost or, or cut... Um, the signal in the, in the frequency spectrum. And the normal audio range that we use, uh, the normal frequency range we use in audio applications uh, is 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. 
And the reason why we use 20 to 20 is because the human ear really doesn't hear anything below 20 or above 20. Uh, and most people can't even hear above 18 or 19,000. So um, the, the normal hearing range for most people is, is actually somewhere between about 30 hertz and about 16 or 17,000 hertz, actually where you start actually hear tones uh, above 17,000 hertz, you start to more or less just sort of sense that there's something there. And below, say, like 40 hertz, um, instead of hearing, you know, audible tones, you start to just feel it, you know, more than you actually hear it. Um, so this is more, more or less just the usable range of audio. Um, most e EQs are going to have uh, sort of different bands of frequencies that you can pull up or pull down. And I want to explain the difference between these. And here you can see just three different shapes. There's one here, here, and here. All of these ones here, these are all called bands. So it's a band of frequencies that you can bump up or bump down. It has like sort of a center frequency to it. Um, it's almost like a little hill or a little trough or a little crest. Um, this sort of, uh, of band is actually called a shelf. Let me turn the, that one off. The shelf is a little bit different in that you can cut the signal and then have it stay cut for, uh, you know, basically all the way down or up here, all the way up the frequency spectrum. And then the last type is a filter. The filter is the one on the bottom, the bottom and, and top end here. A filter is a little bit different than a shelf in that it does cut everything below a certain, frequ a certain frequency, but it continues to cut it, and then you end up with nothing or per the perception of nothing down your low end or your high end. So let's just talk about, um, let's actually start with the, instead of starting, and by the way, you can click on the bands up here to turn them on or off. Let's start with the filters. This type of filter is called a high pass filter, and it's called a high pass because you allow all of your highs through, but you cut the low. So the word pass basically just means allow. This one is a low pass filter. So it allows lows through, but cuts highs. This is a low shelf, and this would be a high shelf. Um, the thing about a shelf is that you can actually boost or cut frequencies. With a filter, you can really only, uh, except for if, uh, like a resonance, uh, when if you're using resonance, you can really only cut signal. You can't really boost signal. Uh, and then with bands, uh, bands, you basically can boost signal or cut signal between sort of like a, a range at a center frequency. So let's go over what the, the sort of the parameters of each one of these are. Let's actually start with the band. With uh, a band, if I click on this one, you can see it's in yellow and it highlights in yellow here and also highlights in yellow here. So these are the co corresponding parameters for this band. Um, you have your center frequency, which is basically the frequency where the center of the band is. You have your uh, boost or gain, which is can be negative or positive. So you can add gain or subtract gain. And <clears throat> excuse me. And then uh, the next, the bottom one is called Q. Q stands for quality, but Q controls the bandwidth of the band. So as you pull this up, you'll end up with a more narrow band. And as you pull this down, you'll get more of like a wide band. So do I want to affect more frequencies or just one sort of small frequency range? Now, with the shelves, instead of a um, instead of a, uh, a center frequency, you get sort of like a, it's not really a cutoff frequency, but it's just sort of like a, the mid slope frequency or whatever. Um, basically, here I'm cutting at uh, four hundred twenty five hertz, but it's actually not you know four hundred twenty five hertz isn't up here; it's actually down here. Um, with the, um, the Q, you get almost sort of like a resonance effect, sort of like a boost up here and more of a cut down here, more, more or less just affects the shape of the slope. And then with filters, um, you have what's called the cutoff frequency. The cutoff frequency is where the signal has been attenuated by three decibels already. So again, you know, our cutoff is at 650. That doesn't mean the slope starts at 650. It means that at 650, we've already attenuated the signal, cut the signal by 600 uh, by three uh, decibels. Um, instead of gain here, we get actually a slope. So slope control. And this basically just will give you a more uh, sort of gradual slope or a more uh, sort of rigid vertical slope. And what these values mean is they're telling you the amount of attenuation per octave, the amount of cut per octave. So if I have uh, 
6 dB per octave, that means we're losing 6 decibels for every octave. If we have uh, 36 dB, we're losing 36 decibels per octave. And then for Q, we actually have something that's called a resonance. Resonance is when you boost the frequency at the cutoff frequency. It's actually a feedback effect. You're feeding, you're creating a feedback loop at the cutoff frequency, causing the cutoff frequency to be boosted just before it's cut. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna recall the default setting to undo all that stuff that I just did there. Let's start with the preset. Let's go to drums. Um, we'll use punchy kick. Let's see what that sounds like. It's okay, it's a little hollowed out because of this sort of mid-range sort of um, trough here. Uh, one thing I like to do, one thing I love about Logic's channel EQ and its linear, linear EQ as well is it has the ability to analyze the signal. Uh, so if you just click on the analyzer button down here, it'll actually give you a display of the frequency, uh, the frequencies in that track. So you're not just playing a guessing game or having to do this completely by ear. You can sort of um, have a more, I would say, a more educated decision as to how you're EQing. With kick drum, I always like to sort of boost uh, boost a band up here in like the one to five k range, uh, just to give it a little bit of that that click. I also will sometimes boost the high end here with the shelf, just again to accentuate the click sound. Um, down in somewhere between the two hundred and five hundred range, I usually like to cut a bit. There's usually sort of like a bit of like a wooden frequency down there that just uh, is annoying, so I like to pull it out. Uh, and then I like to boost the low end a little bit. Uh, and you'll see the, the vast majority of like the fundamental of the kick drum, at least here, is right around 50 hertz. We don't need 20 hertz in there. And if anything, if we have them there, every time the kick hits, it might make a speaker sort of woof or overload a bit. So I'm going to try to just cut everything out, you know, say around 30 or 40 hertz, because it just doesn't need to be there. And we actually have our sub kick down here too, which is going to take care of most of the low end. This The D6 is more or less just going to give us the click, sort of the, the definition of, of, of the kick. All right. Let's go to the uh, the sub kick here. Let's EQ that one by itself. There we go. The sub kick, uh, again, if, if you're not familiar with the sub kick, it's basically just a, a very large um, diaphragm dynamic mic. It basically looks like a little eight inch speaker. Um, that's essentially what it is. And it's just able to pick up sort of like the sub low frequencies uh, in the kick drum. So let's try both of these together. All right. By the way, the reason why I'm starting with kick and snare, I'm gonna move over the snare now. The reason why I'm starting with kick and snare is so that's sort of like the fundamental of our groove for rock music. So um, it's pretty much the the main the main thing driving the groove. So we need to make sure that they're they, they're very uh, defined sounding. So I'm gonna go to the uh, the snare bottom. Normally I'd actually start with the snare top, but again, like I said in the previous video, the snare top's got a, a real nasty ring in it that we're gonna have to maybe take care of later or completely get rid of. Um, so I'm going to start with the, the snare here. So the bottom snare, uh, and by the way, one of the tendencies of snare drum is to, to do this. I mean, even if you look at some of the presets in here, you know, like let's try, uh, 
Rock Snare. Yeah, some of the tendencies are are to just completely boost the high end like that. Um, I'm not a really big fan of that. I like like deep, full snare. And if it needs to be brighter, yeah, we can boost the high end, but not like that. Um, I like to boost sort of the like the 500 to 200 to like 2K range, even like somewhere in here. So I like I like that sort of sound more than anything else. Um, if you want to boost the high end, you can to get some more of the crispiness out of it. Just keep in mind that the hi hat's going to bleed into that uh, pretty badly. I also scooped out the low end a bit, um, not too much because I don't want to you know cut out the low sort of the low uh, tones of the snare, but enough to sort of get the the bass uh, the kick drum out of there a bit. And what some people will do is they'll find like a little peak in here that sounds nice and then sort of like, well, here, I'll show you. They'll find a little peak in there that they like and then pull the, the gain down to a more reasonable level because you pull it up too much and it starts to, the resonance of it starts to whistle, so. All right, let's go with that. Let's go to the snare top here. Let's see what this one sounds like by itself. And yes, I'm aware that some of my tracks are going to start to clip now because as you add gain with an EQ, you're adding gain overall. And so you're going to end up with something that's... Uh, Something that does clip, so we'll worry about that later. I think that's pretty much all we can do for that that upper snare. I don't even know if I'm going to keep it in there, but I'll keep it in there for now. So let's listen to our kicks and our snare tracks. All right, cool. Let's take a look at the the cymbal tracks. Um, let's start with the hi hat. Hi hat. Um, we really don't need a whole lot of low end in the signal. Um, if anything, we can cut out most of the lows just to get rid of the bleed. Yeah, I think that's about all I'm going to do with it. And actually, that's pretty much all I'm going to do with the overheads, too. So what I'm going to do is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to duplicate this plug-in so you can hold option to duplicate and just drag it over to the next track the only thing I'm gonna do differently is with my overheads my overhead tracks um, the way I approach overheads is I like them to kind of pick up the whole drum kit I don't want to think of them as just a symbol uh, like a symbol track like a symbol uh, track I like to think of them as like just picking up the whole kit so I'm gonna boost the high end a little bit cut out some of the lows but not too much of the lows I did cut out a bit more on the uh, the overhead two because the overhead two is a a pair of small diaphragm uh, AKG uh, C four fifty one B. So I'm gonna I'm just 
cut the the low end out of those, but the the main overhead, the spaced overhead. Actually, I'm going to pull the volume up on that. Um, that's a couple of Moh- large diaphragm Mojaves, so they uh, they're picking up sort of the full frequency range. With the room mics, um, I'm going to sort of do the same thing as I did for the the overheads. So I'm just going to duplicate that over there. Um, and you'd be surprised. A lot of people don't realize how much tone o- uh, room mics can add to uh, can add to your drum mix. Yeah, I mean, especially with the snare drum, you know, this, that's really kind of bringing up some of the tone in the snare drum there. Um, and then lastly, we need to get the toms uh, EQ'd. The issue here is going to be trying to find a spot in the song where the toms are actually used, which they're not not very often used. There's only like three, yeah, here we go, three spots in the whole song where they're actually used. So let me just zoom in here right around measure 49. There's a bit of a little fill in here where they're used. Yeah, let's let's just listen to the uh, the toms there. Tom one and floor tom. Yeah, there we go. Um, I'm actually going to use a um, just a preset for the toms. The tom preset's pretty decent, actually. It's uh, let's see, drums. And I think it's under I think it's under Tom Medium. There we go. Yeah, I'm gonna cut a bit more of the low end out. One of the problems I always find with toms is the low end tends to ring a bit too much. And I'm actually gonna pull up this little dip a little bit more. Pull up this. I'm actually gonna add a little boost to sort of the mid, to sort of the one to five k range. One thing I should mention though is between one and five k, this is where your ears are the most sensitive. So really subtle changes can really make a lot of difference between one and 5K. The other thing you wanna be careful about one and 5K is not to boost too many instruments in, in that range because um, it can start to sound megaphony and actually can start to sound uh, to cause ear fatigue. So just be careful how much you boost between one and 5K. Um, I'm gonna take the same setting and I'm just gonna copy it over to the floor tom. This time I'm gonna, since it's a lower tom, I'm gonna pull the boost down a bit more. Actually, going to pull this cut over and pull it down quite a bit more. There you go. You know, I should mention there is one little. I'm not sure if it's a glitch or, or what, but sometimes when I click on the value here, I can drag up and down to make it up and down. Other times, I have to drag left and right, and I'm not really sure what controls that. It just sometimes does it, and sometimes doesn't do it, and I'm not really sure. Yeah, it's like if I click on sort of the center part of of the of the number I drag up or down to change it. But if I dra- uh, click over like on the left side of it, I have to drag left and right. It's like two different clicking zones. So just be aware of that. Um, so left is drag left and right, right is drag up and down, which I don't know. I don't know why it's that way. It's just, it's that way. Um, all right, let's, uh, let's boost this a bit more for the low tom. There we go. So let's see what this sounds like now. All right, so let's listen to the drums all together here. And I'm gonna listen to the drums for, let's take a listen from the verse, basically, let's say mid verse on. Whoops. Let's try that again. Yeah, you may you may hear this, but when the kick hits, 
There's a bit of like a ring in one of the other tracks. We may have to take care of that. I have a feeling it's in the Tom tracks, but uh, we can take care of that, uh, that another day. Okay, so that's just EQing the drums. Um, in the next video, we'll move on to uh, EQing the guitar and the bass. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and thanks for watching.